So first and foremost, I just want to thank everybody for joining us today. We still have a um, number of people who probably will still be hopping on in the next few minutes, but um, we'll just let them join as we go. So this is our third presentation uh, in the Computational Neuroscience Summer Speaker Series. Uh, we're really grateful that you've joined us all today. We've had a really positive response to this series. Um, so we're really looking forward to the possibility of carrying it on, as Arthur just mentioned, in the fall. Um, but we'll let everybody know what that looks like. So my name is Hilary Henninger. I am the, comp or, sorry, the Communications and Events Coordinator for Campus Alberta Neuroscience, and I'm housed in Calgary. Shannon Walk Woke is also on the call, um, just in case there's any issues. Uh, she is the Research Strategy Coordinator based out of Edmonton for CAN. It's all right, I'm just admitting people. <laughs> So um, just a few reminders, you'll be muted when you come in. We will be uh, recording this call and we'll be posting it to our website um, over the next couple of weeks so that people can access the information again uh, or if for anybody who missed it or would like to share this information. Be approximately 30 minutes for the presentation. We will take a break halfway through and then we will also do a Q&A halfway through and then towards the end. So if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to uh, use the chat function and send them to me throughout the presentation and then I will moderate them um, for Dr. Lutzak as we go through it. So um, just to give you some sort of background, uh, Dr. Arthur Lutzak received a Master's in Science in Biomedical Engineering in 2002 as well as his PhD uh, in Pol or from Poland, pardon me, during that time, he was also awarded fellowships in the Netherlands, France, and Italy. During his postdoctoral training at Yale University and at Rutgers University, he studied information processing in neural populations, neuronal populations, using experimental and theoretical methods. In 2009, Dr. Lutzak joined the University of Lethbridge as an assistant professor and was subsequently promoted to an associate professor. So I hope you'll join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Archer Lutzak today to share with us his presentation, Data-Driven Analysis to Study Behavioral and Neuronal Activity. So please go ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this kind introduction and uh, for inviting me here. And uh, thank you to all of you for uh, coming here to listen about uh, what we are doing in our lab. So, um, um, if, you, if something is not clear, feel free to unmute yourself and uh, ask a question. But also, uh, as Hilary said, uh, in the middle of the talk, uh, I will uh, have a break and we can talk uh, more, uh, a little bit about those uh, things. So in the first part, I will give you some overview uh, how brain uh, process information. And uh, in the second half, I will uh, tell you about uh, how to use deep neural networks to decode behavior and how to link it to uh, neuronal information. So uh, usually I'm starting with this uh, slide uh, because uh, outside Alberta, nobody knows where is Ledbridge. And I'm telling that this is a view you can see from my window if I drive two hours west. So uh, um, let's start. Okay. so. Uh, Everybody knows uh, how brain look like, and we know that certain parts of the brain do different things. Um, but uh, uh, what is uh, really interesting and maybe not known to people doing some uh, uh, more machine learning is that uh, if we look at rat brain, all the parts of our human brains uh, can be also found in this uh, little rat brain. So rat brain is of this size, but all the uh, brain parts, uh, what we have, also rat have. So uh, my personal uh, biggest discovery in, in neuroscience, it was re realization that uh, uh, we humans are just bigger rats, that, that uh, uh, you know, uh, rats are so clever and uh, you, you, we are working with these rats uh, and, and everybody who had a uh, pet will know it that uh, even if uh, two rats are genetically identical, um, some rats are really happy to, to do some tasks, other, ta other rats are just lazy, so they have own personalities as we have, and it's uh, really amazing to, to get appreciations that these little chunks of tissues, these little brains, 
can do uh, you know, almost as much as uh, our human brains. So we just have this bigger brains with slightly more computational abilities, but uh, more I'm learning about rats' brains, uh, more I see myself as uh, a little bit bigger rat. Okay, so uh, this is how we are doing our experiments by putting some electrodes into brain and by recording uh, activity of uh, hundreds, uh, tens or hundreds of uh, neurons so we can better understand how information is uh, exchanged between those uh, little uh, neurons. Um, okay, so here is a simple uh, picture of one of the recordings. So here is two seconds of data. Uh, and record and the electrode is in auditory cortex, which is processing sounds. And here it was complete silence. And during second half of this in this picture, we presented some stimulus, some like a tone beep. And the amazing thing, at least for me, is that even in this complete silence where animals is in soundproof box, this auditory cortex is not silent. The activity in the brain is all the time. Uh, uh, going there. So this is called spontaneous activity, activity which is not directly driven by any uh, external uh, stimuli. So uh, I think about this spontaneous activity as this dark matter of the brain because uh, it accounts for something like uh, more than 90% of brain activity, but we really don't know what this spontaneous activity is meant for what is the role of this activity it takes enormous amount of energy but why why brain would be doing it uh, one idea uh, uh, were proposed uh, for example by bruce mcnaughton who is also in in Ledbridge, that uh, when we learn something then later when we rest we replay this uh, memories and it is one of the parts of, of spontaneous activity but probably it is just a fraction of the, the, the function of spontaneous activity. So uh, my uh, one of the goals is to better understand what is this uh, functions of this uh, brain, uh, this spontaneous brain activity. Um, okay, so uh, here is uh, another illustration of, of uh, recordings from uh, uh, auditory cortex and here we presented tone and here is spontaneous activity and this is under uh, anesthesia, so there is very sparse activity, but nevertheless you can see that tone is evoking some activity and also spontaneously without any stimulation activity also is uh, occurring. And one interesting thing was that when we look closer we found that the similar sequential structure in the activity during stimulus evoke and spontaneous packets. So what I mean is that neurons which likes to fire earlier to stimuli, they also like to initiate this spontaneous burst. So this spontaneous activity is not so just random noise, uh, but rather it is uh, uh, very similar to activity which is evoked by uh, some uh, stimuli. And uh, here we have some average uh, activity of two tones and average activity during this spontaneous burst. And here are some uh, main uh, papers uh, on this uh, topic uh, from uh, which, uh, from, which I wrote. So uh, the thing which is interesting is that uh, if here is some cartoon of activity of uh, four neurons in response to one stimulus, and here is activity to some other stimulus, you see that uh, this activity is a little bit different, but it has overall this sequential structure. So if we superimpose it, it would be quite similar. So it was uh, one of the uh, surprising discoveries that uh, activity to different stimuli are not completely different, but rather they are small variation on some common uh, theme. And to better illustrate it, here is some uh, cartoon of uh, activity space. So what this uh, gray box uh, illustrates is some uh, space of all possible neuronal patterns. So you can think that one dot here, it illustrates, uh, it corresponds to this pattern. One dot here may correspond to this pattern. Uh, and here, what is this white? It is the space of the spontaneous patterns, these patterns of activity which uh, occur without any stimulation. And when we present some stimuli, then patterns which occur 
are not somewhere in anywhere in this space in some completely different patterns, but rather they are subspace of this spontaneous pattern. So they, the stimulus evoked patterns also have some sequential activity. So you can think about it that uh, sleep is nice example of spontaneous activity not driven by any sensory stimulus directly. So during your dreams, you have some wild imaginations that you are flying or doing this and that. And what you experience in reality is only a subset of those, uh, all the uh, possible uh, adventures you can uh, experience during dream. And here it's something similar we observe in, by looking at neuronal uh, patterns. One other interesting thing is that uh, uh, neurons which are acting uh, earlier during this spontaneous, uh, pa uh, in this spontaneous uh, patterns, they have more general information like, oh, this is uh, face. And those later neurons have more specific information. Oh, this is face of my friend John, who is owning me uh, 50 bucks uh, for the beer last week. So those neurons have much more specific information which are firing later. Uh, and it's a little bit similar that those bursts of activity, which we call packets, they are a little bit similar as uh, uh, information sent over internet, that information when uh, sent over internet is also divided in some small chunks in packets. And the uh, earlier, earlier activity in those uh, uh, internet protocol packets have some general information, just send it there and this is part of the picture. And later, in, later information in this packet has more details. What exactly is this information? And it seems that in our brain, it's something similar that those early neurons tell, oh, this is just uh, uh, some uh, particular, uh, some sound. And those later neurons are saying, oh, this is sound uh, reminding me this uh, song uh, which I heard uh, uh, last week. Uh, so by knowing such things, it may help us to better understand this language of the brain. One other interesting thing about uh, how brain process information is that uh, uh, when we are sleepy, there are those uh, quite distinct uh, bursts of activity, as you can see here. And here is some cartoons showing it that uh, those bursts with sequential activity. But uh, when we are awake, the activity is uh, much more continuous like. And uh, when we look more closely, what it turns out is it's not that this activity is continuous, but rather those bursts of activity are occurring more closely to each other. So you can imagine that when you are sleepy, there is much less information to process. So your brain may be sending information, those packets like bam, bam, bam. But when you are awake and there is a lot of things to process, can uh, there is this bam, 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 this uh, much more closer those packets because more has to be put uh, within a limited time window. So it seems that uh, uh, this information in the brain is not processed continuously, but rather in this uh, discrete uh, burst, which we call uh, packets. We also did some experiments showing that uh, when animals are learning something, then those packets are changing, so it suggests that those packets are not some epiphenomenon, that they are really related to uh, uh, learning to some basic uh, processes in the brain. Uh, so here is some cartoon illustrating how uh, we present some uh, tactile stimulations to the rat, and here is some average activity sorted. Uh, uh, and when we look at uh, activity before stimulation, we see that the spontaneous packets have more or less similar sequential order, but after stimulations, they are reorganized, and now they are much more similar to this uh, stimulation. So it means that because we bombarded this animal with this tactile stimulation, now this animal thinks, oh, this must be some really important uh, information, this stimuli, and uh, it reorganized this spontaneous activity, that now this spontaneous activity really resembles this uh, stimulus evoke uh, patterns. Um, also, what we found interesting is that uh, when we recorded activity in uh, epileptic animals, 
and here is a half a second of activity in a, uh, during seizure. So you see this uh, kind of sequential patterns, but those, packer, those uh, patterns are much more repeated, uh, much more similar to each other than in these spontaneous uh, patterns. So it seems like what's going wrong in epilepsy is that those uh, packets with sequential activity are now getting very stereotypical, very similar. So if something is too regular in the brain, it, uh, it's not good. So having this variability in, in those packets, it seems to be something natural. And when there is this uh, quite uh, repeated, repetitive patterns, uh, then it is not good. But nevertheless, these repetitive patterns were also quite similar to the spontaneous packets which occur earlier. And it's quite important because now from the spontaneous packets occurring before seizure, we can predict uh, what will be the sequential orders of activity during seizures and even which neurons will be participating in uh, seizures, which uh, can be quite important for breaking those circuits to prevent uh, seizures. Okay, so uh, uh, what I told you is that uh, in the brain we have this activity not continuous but rather uh, composed of the separate packets that neurons on the beginning of those packets, uh, uh, I didn't mention this before, but uh, here they have this uh, more broad tuning, they respond to more general informations. I was saying they have this uh, saying, oh, this is tone but those later neurons have this much more specific information. So why those little observations would be uh, potentially important? Well, um, let's look at some analogy with uh, DNA. So we have this sequence, DNA sequence, and it's not only important to know that it has this double helix, but also what is crucial is to know that this information is divided in some specific chunks in the specific genes, and what is the starting sequence of the gene? What is the uh, end sequence uh, of each gene? Those are very important informations to decode uh, genome. And similarly here, by knowing that uh, our brain activity is divided in those chunks and what patterns are starting each of those chunks and what type of patterns are on the end of those chunks will help us uh, hopefully to better understand uh, how this information in the brain, the meaning of the information in the brain. So uh, the big question is why brain would choose to process this information in those discrete chunks? And uh, one idea is that, well, if we get some, uh, uh, here are some, let's say, three frames from some videos and um, uh, we see it, uh, but each of those frames when we see we need to somehow compare if it is what expected. So we need to compare it with unexpected. So here is, for example, exactly the same stimulus, but reverse. So here, now, if, if you see that this guy suddenly rotated, it would be unexpected. So our brain, to make uh, sense from external world, uh, I suggest that, and it was suggested by many other people, all the time is comparing to what expected. And uh, it takes some time to, to uh, compare this uh, incoming information from expected, and it is what is duration of the single packet, that only after seeing single frame and comparing if it is exactly as expected or different, and we should pay more attention, uh, only next piece of information uh, can be processed. Uh, okay, so uh, this was a quick overview of what we are doing uh, in processing, in understanding brain information. And in the next part, I will tell you about deep neuronal networks used to how to analyze behavior and related to packets. So now let's have a have few minutes break. And if you have any questions, uh, let's let uh, chat now. If anybody's got any questions, just feel free to uh, unmute yourself and just ask them right now. I didn't receive any um, in the intro, but uh, my guess is that if we didn't get any then. Uh, Hello, I have a question. Sure. Maybe you will answer it later in your talk, but what kind of data analysis methods you used? Very good. So, uh, 
because of uh, short duration of this talk, I didn't uh, go into details, but uh, here I was uh, using just simple uh, cross correlations. Uh, so for example, to detect the sequential order, uh, what uh, we did, uh, for example, is uh, looking at uh, how activity of neuron uh, one correlates with activity of neuron two. And we found that doing this cross correlation analysis during stimulus presentation and uh, separately mm -hmm. doing the same analysis for spontaneous activity gave us similar results. These cross correlations tell us that this one neuron, it tends on average precede the other neuron. And this is uh, what we were uh, looking for. Okay, so it means uh, that you um, still have a potential to use all the power of modern machine learning. Exactly, and this is what will be my second uh, part of mm. the talk. So here I use about this uh, ancient uh, results, what I was uh, analyzing data when I didn't know how to do it better, but now I will tell you some cool stuff. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I would like to say it's a very informative uh, session so far. My question is, how did you differentiate, uh, what is the main differentiator between the metadata information which brain produces before? Uh, you, you told, right, that the information which is metadata and actual data. What, how do you differentiate it? Um, yeah, that yeah, so I'm not sure what you mean by metadata. In our experiments, what we did is that uh, we had this period of uh, spontaneous activity where there was no stimulation, so this is like that. And also for uh, some period we presented stimuli, like beeps, some tones, and we just compare how the activity during the stimulus presentations compares to this spontaneous activity when they say, uh, no any sensory inputs, uh, at least auditory inputs in this case. Uh, okay, what I meant with metadata information is that header part you told, right? The header and the actual data. How do you differentiate between, uh, you gave an example of a packet, right? Oh, okay, in the before, okay. Right? Uh, uh, and now I see what uh, uh, you mean. Uh, uh, where is this slide? Okay. This one. Uh, so, uh, here in this internet protocol packet, uh, uh, it's very clear what is the header and what is the data. Here, uh, so this is very loose analogy. Uh, it's probably not the best one. But uh, here, what you see in those neuronal packets, there is no any clear transition what is this uh, uh, header, this metadata, and the actual data. It's rather a signal pro uh, as time pro progresses those neurons which are firing later, they have this more uh, elaborate information. So uh, why it would happen like that? Uh, the way how I understand it, how I think about it is uh, that uh, when you receive stimulus, first there is this just fit forward information. So this activity of those early neurons is just activated by stimulus. But this information is not held in visual cortex, is going now to rest of the brain and is going back. So this, like in recurrent networks, activity starts to propagate into the entire brain. So those later neurons now are getting information from uh, secondary uh, sensory areas, here maybe from some prefrontal co uh, cortex to get some uh, uh, emotional information about the stimulus. So uh, it is like in this, uh, if you activate recurrent network, first activity, it will be related just to the stimuli, but as network, as this activity reverberate through this network, it will get uh, more and more abstract information connected with what network learn uh, before. Does it answer your question? Yes, thank you. Thank you, good question. Are there any other questions before we move on? Okay. I think so, I just uh, have one question here, Arthur, from Ayush. Was that already asked? I don't believe so. So the question is in visual cortex, 
there are neutrons which are receptive to specific orientation of light in the visual field. Does auditory cortex also have neurons to fire in the presence of specific to sound pattern, or they use different strategy to process sound information? Very good. So, uh, what well, the first question is that uh, it was discovered uh, uh, that neurons in auditory cortex, uh, in, in visual cortex, respond to things like uh, line of uh, some line to detect uh, contours uh, and so on. And similar processing principles are in auditory cortex. It is uh, a loop, so neurons are tuned to some specific uh, frequency and later to some patterns of those frequencies. So it is analogous like in visual cortex where at this early stages, neurons only respond to some uh, lines. Uh, uh, so in auditory cortex, neurons would be responding to some uh, simple tones. Uh, so the, what is called tonotopy. Uh, so neurons are similarly organized as in a visual area. So to detect these basic features and tend to uh, build on those basic features. Thank, thank you. I, I like that understanding. Wonderful. So let's just move on to the second half. It's now almost 1230. So we're right on time. So Arthur can go ahead and do the second half of the presentation and we'll do another Q&A at the very end of that. Great. Thank you. Um, so uh, as you know, there are those artificial neuronal networks which are making amazing progress that, uh, you know, uh, 20 years ago to detect a dog in the picture, it was uh, unthinkable challenge that you know here you have this c-shaped object in the air and to classify as a dog it really takes uh, quite a bit of uh, imagination uh, and it's difficult to somehow define what features of this image would uh, correspond uh, to dog and uh, in neural networks now you can easily solve such tasks uh, so uh, uh, it's, it's really amazing uh, progress and uh, because new those networks are getting so good at image processing, they are now starting getting used in, in uh, for example, self-driving cars, where you have to online detect uh, other cars, detect signs, detect uh, lanes, uh, and uh, yeah, it seems like those neurons and uh, neural networks are doing amazing job. So uh, we decided to start using these uh, networks also to help us to understand some. Uh, uh, neuroscience data. Um, so we started uh, first with uh, not neuronal activity, but rather with uh, animal behavior. So here you see three frames from a rat who is uh, reaching for food pellet. So here in the front is a sweet food pellet, which rat likes. And here is in the middle some opening. So rat has to lift the hand to reach for it to eat this uh, food pellet. And why we would train rats to do it? Well, uh, this is nice test to see how well a rat is recovering, for example, from stroke. That normal rat will, read, uh, will reach as we. If this is food pellet, it will just grab, ex, uh, move the hand toward this uh, food pellet, grasp it, and put it to mouth. Rat with stroke cannot do this uh, fine movement. It will rather extend hand on the top of the foot pellet, drop it, and then try to pull it. Uh, so uh, by looking at those details, those fine movements, uh, we can say how well a rat recovers from stroke. And why we want to do it? Well, uh, if we want to, to test first some therapies for stroke recovery, the best first is to test it on rat brains, on rats. So here to see how well a rat recovers from stroke, uh, we need to run those tests and behavior is telling us how well a rat is improving with different therapies. So this takes enormous amount of job to analyze those videos. And uh, many grad students uh, uh, lost many beautiful summers just by sitting in dark lab and looking at those videos. So uh, applying machine learning for that, uh, it greatly improves uh, uh, life quality of many grad students. So uh, uh, we use, so I will tell uh, more about the network, but uh, here's just to show that 
this is how experts call it. Uh, those movements, he's, he's how our neural networks call it. So it was uh, uh, pretty correlated. Uh, it's not exactly the, the uh, everything points on the, co uh, on the diagonal, which would be perfect predictions. Uh, because even if you compare two experts, there would be similar discrepancy between their results. So uh, this neural network did uh, uh, as good as expert. What was interesting is that uh, even that we train network to score those videos uh, based on this expert uh, scoring to reproduce expert, uh, how expert would evaluate those rats. Later when we look uh, how those network scores correlate with the extent of the lesion, it turns out that networks somehow learn from those videos some features which were better predictors of extent of the stroke than expert scores, which are here in this uh, yellow. So uh, it seems like even that network was learned, trained to reproduce expert uh, scoring, it somehow discovers some features uh, which were more predictive of actual uh, brain lesion. So now let's talk more how exactly this network work. So here we have this uh, videos of rats and each frame was processed by convolutional network, which uh, he ate, it was called inception. And what this network was doing, it was extracting some uh, features from, from uh, these videos. As during one of the questions, uh, I said that in visual cortex, neurons are extracting some features like uh, some lines, some contours of, of object. Similarly, both networks are extracting uh, features like uh, some neurons may be responding to some L shape, which represent, for example, when a rat is uh, uh, reaching for something and the arm is in this L shape. Some, some neurons may, for example, detect such L shape. Uh, and so each of those uh, videos where uh, frames was processed through these inceptions to extract this high-level features and those artificial neurons, uh, activity of those artificial neurons representing those features were then taken to recurrent network to predict this uh, movement deficits. But the most uh, interesting part is here, that uh, now there are methods which are allowing to extract knowledge from the network. So now we can ask, which of those features were the most important for the network to make predictions? And we can see, uh, we found that some neurons were particularly, uh, particularly important for, for this network decision. So it means that some features in those images were very informative to distinguish control versus stroke rat. And also we can ask this network in which particular a place in the image those uh, uh, features were, where network was paying attention to make its decision about classifying control versus stroke rats. And here we see this region, so uh, it corresponds that uh, to this uh, hand. So indeed, when network was making decision, it was looking at, at the hand and not, uh, for example, at the color of the fur. So uh, here it is nice that now we can ask neuronal network what are the things, what are the important. And uh, so here what we did is that we choose, let's say, 50 neurons which are the most uh, informative for the network. And activity of those 50 neurons, now we collapse to two dimensions, to di two dimensional space with principal component analysis. So here, each of the dots represent uh, one frame in video. And uh, here you can think about this dot, this frame representation as a dot in 100 dimensional space. So if we had 100 neurons, it would be this 100 dimensional space. And now it is just collapsed to two dimensions. And blue, uh, with these frames of videos from uh, before giving stroke to rat, and threat uh, after giving stroke. So you see that there is some, that those two clouds not overlap completely. So it seems like there are some frames which are informative to distinguish uh, control versus uh, stroke rats. So what we found, and it was interesting when we look to which frames those points correspond, 
we found that network was not really looking at this reaching, but was looking what rat is doing after this reaching. If rat was using both hands on the end to eat this food pellet, it means that it can operate nicely both hands. So it was the best predictor that this is healthy, normal rat. Now, when we look at frames here, what we found is that, uh, again, it was not so much this reaching, but the most informative for the network, it was if rat was trying to cheat, if it was trying to reach with the mouth instead of hand for the food pellet. So uh, uh, it was really interesting because, you know, people were looking at this task and scoring these rats for tens of years and applying this network and extracting information from the network told us that no, there are some even more informative features which you can uh, extract from RAT. And what was also interesting is that here is the, uh, this picture uh, is uh, here. So the data in this uh, 100 dimensional space can be clustered and each of those cluster now can co is corresponding to some single movement component. So it is like this uh, unsupervised way to divide all these complex movements in some basic small components. And now what we can also look is how each of those components is affected by stroke. So here it is uh, on this axis is showing how much is affected by stroke each component. And here we can see that mostly in healthy rats you see this eating with both hands uh, and a lot of sniffing, but as uh, in more uh, rats affected by stroke, uh, the component, as I said, with this uh, trying to reach with mouth and also pronations, how much uh, is exact position of the hand is important and so on. So uh, this is also interesting to bring that I told you that information in the brain is processed in those discrete packets. And it seems that behavior also can be divided in those discrete uh, uh, discrete beads, discrete units, uh, which may correspond to those packets. And this is what I will uh, study in future. So here's another interesting example where we apply our network and here's rat walking on the ladder. So he it is, has to walk uh, uh, here. And uh, again, our network was predicting as good as uh, expert uh, how well rat is uh, walking. And uh, Again, we make similar plot and look what uh, movie frames were most correspond, most representing control and stroke rat. So for control rat, it is this normal walking as expected. For stroke rats, what we found is that uh, uh, this is what uh, experts were scoring, how many times rat slipped its hands. So when rat has stroke, it cannot uh, walk uh, very nicely and often it slip hand. And this is what network was also paying attention. And here we look at uh, what exactly in this frame network was paying attention and indeed it was paying attention to the hand. But when we look what network was paying attention to this control uh, frames, to this control rat, we found that it also looking at the posture. So it is something what experts, again, didn't pay much, much attention. And it is very similar as you know, when you are healthy, you walk straight, you are happy, you walk fast. When you sick, then you are, you know, you have different posture, you walk slower. So uh, this was very nice that network used not only this sleeping of the hand what expert only use, but also discover some other feature like this posture to uh, judge if it is uh, a healthy or not rat. And the last example I will show you, it's uh, here. So this is a pup of the rat, and here it is put in the center of the uh, arena of this box. And now we are just looking how much this rat is moving, and we are counting how many of those square boxes uh, rat is uh, covering. And again, we apply our network, and now we ask network, which of the frames were the most important for you to distinguish uh, between, uh, nor between control and uh, rats. Uh, so here I will mention that uh, there are two groups of rats. One is uh, control and the other group of rats is from moms which experience nicotine before getting pregnant. So uh, here uh, it's starting to affect like if mom 
was smoking before getting pregnant and quit smoking and then got pregnant, how it affects uh, uh, offspring's uh, kids. So here it is the experiment. So here, uh, uh, example of some rat without, uh, from normal mother, and we're comparing it to uh, pups from moms which use uh, nicotine uh, before uh, uh, pregnancy. And network found that first frame was very important. And uh, it was uh, quite surprising to us. And uh, we show these results to Ian Wishow, who is uh, a foremost expert in behavioral analysis. And he looked more closely at those first frames of two groups. And what, we, what he found is that, indeed, that after closer inspection, uh, these animals from moms which use nicotine, uh, they had these uh, legs much more spread. So you can think as uh, when you are drunk, when you are not function properly, can you, you will be walking with your feet more spread. You will have more problems to keep balance. But control animals had nice tight feet so they could move uh, much better. So again, something that uh, experts were just counting number of squares and never uh, noticed that even from the first frame of those experiments, it is possible to say if the animals were from control or nicotine group. The other interesting thing here, what you notice is some periodicity. So uh, nicotine rats, when we look more closely, again, with help of uh, Ian Wishow, uh, when you see here consecutive frames, uh, some frames, you see that after something like uh, 10 frames, uh, some uh, behavior is uh, repeated. So this rat is uh, moving a little bit away from the center, but later is coming back. And you see that he's now doing exactly the same sequence of movements. And when you look at control rat, again, you see something similar that it goes away, but is going back. But these uh, control rats have a little bit uh, more diverse repertoire of movements. These movements are not exact copies of previous sequence. So it seems like uh, how to interpret is that in this uh, Nick from rats from nicotines, these movements were very stereotypical. And uh, as in control rats, the movements were more uh, uh, diverse. And it suggests that those control rats are developing a little bit faster, that they are developing this repertoire of move, bigger repertoire of movements. So it seems like you can think that this exposure to nicotine before con uh, preconception uh, affected uh, speed of development of those uh, uh, pups. And uh, now we are starting work, working not only with uh, uh, rats, but also with uh, people. So here is uh, some, uh, uh, some screenshot from uh, Claudia Gonzalez lab. She's doing a lot of experiments looking at the kids. So here she's asking this kid to reproduce this uh, uh, Lego blocks uh, structure. So now kids has to find blocks to, to reproduce exactly this. And now she is looking carefully how this kid is reaching for, uh, for the blocks. And what is interesting is that she also uh, uh, correlated with executive functions. So those kids are also getting some tests for their uh, uh, mental abilities. There's also sur survey with parents. Um, and uh, now we want to apply this neuronal network to tell us just by looking at how kid is playing with Lego blocks, if it is developing at normal level, or maybe there are some movements, abnormalities that will help us to uh, find kids which need some more attention. So uh, this is that this work on the rats is very interesting, but it is like a paving way for work with humans, because as I said, if something works with rats, usually it also works with uh, humans. So uh, I told you uh, that we are finding that brain is processed information in this discrete packets. So now we also have tools with these deep neural networks to analyze behavior, and we will apply the same tools back to analyze uh, neuronal data to help us to find link between those neuronal bursts of activity and components of behavior. And uh, here is example of some rat that we not only will be recording brain activity and filming what this rat is doing, 
but also we will put some little cameras on the top of those rats so we can see what rat is seeing. So now it is with this uh, connections, but later it will be wireless connections. So we can see from rat perspective what he's seeing, what he's experiencing, and correlate it with uh, packets of uh, brain uh, activity. Okay, so uh, in summary, I showed you that this information in the brain is processed in those packets, that uh, we believe that those packets are those building blocks of cortical coding, that each bit of information has to be compared with expectation before next bit can be processed. And now I showed you some uh, results from deep neural networks, which are very good at analyzing bits of uh, behavior, which parts of the behavior are abnormal. And we will use the same things to analyze neuronal data so we can find which neuronal packets are abnormal or uh, unusual and so on. And uh, I tried to put in this presentation a lot of work and uh, uh, it was done with many, many people uh, uh, helped me. Uh, so here, for example, Ivan Soltes helped with epilepsy, but he also should be here in this artificial intelligence and behavior uh, category because when I was on sabbatical in his lab, he made the, he, he told me how important it is to develop some methods for uh, automated analysis of behavior. So uh, all the credits uh, goes to him for this uh, second uh, part. So if you have questions about what I told you or about Krakow, Poland, now is a good time to ask. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for a great talk. I think you did impressive work, but I have a question. Yes, please. Yeah, so I know that uh, when people, I'm talking about the grasping of this af after stroke mice. Yeah. Usually when people describe movements, for example, when they make this movie simulations for Hollywood or when they analyze movements, they kind of put these points and instead of having all the video frame to analyze, they have this, um, let's say a much less data exactly about movement. Do you understand what I'm talking about? I just yes. can't describe it well, yeah. So yeah, why so, did you use it? Why did you use the old video frame? Yes, so what uh, uh, she's saying is that uh, it's difficult to analyze uh, such videos. So what people are using to simplify it is that they can put some actual or virtual markets market uh, marks on, on the hand. So only computer is tracing where those markers on the fingers, for example, are moving. So instead of having this analyze uh, thousands of pixels, it only analyzes a few points where those uh, markers on the body are moving. Um, and uh, it's great tool, but our method, uh, I think, is going beyond it. It's uh, because here we we don't need to make decision which of those movements, which of those body parts are the most important. We are just letting network to figure it out what's important, what's not. So I think it is much better in this sense. Also, you yeah. know, it doesn't require the step that you have to put those markers on the body, that you are just giving this raw videos and network now is smart enough to uh, extract all this information. So this what we are doing is more difficult but it's also more rewarding and as i said uh, it gives this uh, more unconstrained formations because as i showed experts may have some uh, misjudgment which things are important and which are not important and by asking people to decide where to put those markers on the body uh, it puts this uh, uh, assumptions which our network doesn't have so our network, I would try to sell it as step forward. Okay, I would say that it's two different things. If you really want to concentrate on the grasp, you have to put those markers, but you try to research everything just because you could, just because you had computation. So it's two different methods. I would say if you need really a grasp, you, move, you need to put those markers. So you're right that for some questions, these markers could be quite useful, but uh, why are you putting those markers? Well, you are putting these markers to analyze this grasp because you want to correlate with, for example, some uh, disorders like in Parkinson people uh, looking how this grasp differ. It, get, it can give a lot of information uh, how the disease is uh, progressing in the Parkinson disease and so on. 
So you are using those markers not uh, to, to have these descriptions of the grass, but because you, you want somehow to relate it to some uh, health condition. Mm. And uh, here what we are saying, well, you can relate it, these movements to health conditions directly without putting those markers. So, uh, um, yeah, I think that uh, those markers are like a middle step to have some data to, to relate it to health. And what I'm trying to say is that we don't need this middleman data to, to get the same uh, end results. Okay, thank you. Good question, thank you. Are there any other questions? Uh, hi, I'm curious to know how much training is involved before making the prediction from the model. Uh, so, uh, yes, uh, one of the drawbacks of this uh, deep neural networks is the uh, amount of uh, training data set which it needs. So, uh, here for this, for example, project, we had about 600 uh, videos. Uh, and those, uh, yeah, so it is a lot of data which needs to be provided to the train this network. After having this network, uh, I think it takes something like uh, less than one day to, to train it to have this uh, performance. But uh, yeah, it requires a lot of data. This is one of the drawbacks. Uh, are those manually ta tagged um, as a target? Uh, so uh, this is another good question. So what we did in our analysis is that all of those 600 videos have to be uh, scored manually by expert to give this training data set to, to network. But what we show is that uh, if we only give, let's say, 80% of this data to the network to train and try to predict on 20% of uh, rats which were never used by this network, this network generalizes well to new, new rats, new examples. So, uh, for example, if your lab is doing similar, the same uh, behavioral test on many groups of mice, probably what you need is train it on this human score videos for this first group of mice, and it should generalize pretty well for the other groups of mice. So you do this enormous work of scoring for the first group, but later you can have these predictions uh, automatically. That's a very interesting approach. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions at this time? I had uh, one quick question. Um, just regarding that very last point that you made, um, for your training data, do you control for mouse uh, fur color and stuff like that? Or, or do you have a variety of different uh, uh, mice colors? Very good. So uh, because uh, all those uh, rats are genetically identical from the same uh, breeding colony, from the same mother and so on. So uh, it somehow reduces uh, variability. But you're right, uh, uh, it's possible to distinguish that uh, this rat may have a little bit more white marks here than this. Uh, so that's a good point. Uh, however, what we did is, as I said, we use this cross-validation approach where we train network on 80% uh, of rats and predicted uh, the, all, and all those results what I'm pre presenting here are predictions on those rats which were not shown to the, net, to the network during training. So those rats for which network is predicting, they can have a slightly different fair color, a slightly different ear shape or whatever, uh, and network seems to be generalizing well to discard those uh, individual variability and only focus on this uh, most important uh, behavioral components. And also one thing I mentioned is that uh, uh, because we can look later where the network was paying attention when making the decision, we can see that uh, indeed it is paying attention to, to hands uh, rather than to background uh, how, how, how gray is uh, given rat and so on. Does it answer your question? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Are there any other questions at this time?
Okay, so you can always email me if you have some uh, questions. Uh, you can easily Google my name and, and find email. So uh, I would be glad to chat or send emails uh, if you want. Uh, and all of the stuff uh, what I presented, most of the stuff is uh, published and we put online all of those networks. So if you want to access this network, you can just download it from GitHub and uh, run it. And if you have any problems, uh, 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 postdocs working with me who develop those networks will be happy to, to help you to get it work. And so with that, I think we are approaching the end of the hour. So it's 1256, so good timing. Um, thank you to everybody who participated with us today. We are hoping to continue this series if possible um, into the fall, but we'll be announcing that at the end of summer. So a huge thank you to Dr. Archer Lutzak for joining us and for um, putting this presentation on for us. We really, really appreciate it. It's a great way for us to build out the CN community. The next presentation, so we'll be taking two weeks break, and then the next presentation will be on August 27th with Dr. Craig Chapman. So I hope that people will join us for that, and that'll be our last presentation for the summer. So thank you to everybody here. You'll be able to find the recording of this on our website in the next week. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank Have you for giving me the opportunity to share it. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.